Well, good evening again, and welcome back to Victor Baptist Church and our YouTube channel. I appreciate all the faithfulness again. I know I say that every week, uh, but as we look to see uh, who all's connecting, or at least uh, that people are still connecting, uh, it just uh, is always an encouragement to know that uh, our people are staying so faithful uh, to be under the sound of the preaching of the Word of God, and uh, that's an encouragement to me. And uh, you know, all, all kidding aside, it was it, it is uh, getting old to preach to empty pews. And it's good to know somebody's listening, but uh, it really is an encouragement. I want you to know that. And uh, I know many of you are getting really excited to finally get back here. And again, it, it, it's I'm always reluctant to try to give too much information because like today is is Thursday. And when you're listening to this, it'll be Sunday night and many things can change between now and Sunday night. But uh, as uh, plans go forward, we'll be back together in just a couple of weeks, uh, at least initially. And uh, I know I'm getting excited for that. I've been uh, kind of thinking about how many of you are going to have to uh, either get new quarantine wardrobes uh, because your clothes no longer fit. I've been careful about that, but uh, uh, also uh, been kind of joking around with some people noticing uh, people's hair is starting to look a little bit like uh, uh, Donald Trump's. Uh, I heard that yesterday. Uh, nobody able to get haircuts. Uh, made me grateful that uh, I started cutting my own hair uh, probably 20 years ago. But uh, anyway, I know all that stuff is uh, stuff you're all dealing with, and here soon you're going to be able to get back to normal, uh, Lord willing. But until then, uh, we're going to keep doing exactly what we're doing. I hope you've gotten your information in the mail about how things are going to go forward uh, or through email. If not, please reach out to the church office and uh, let us know if you have any questions or need anything. All right, grab your Bibles. We're going to go back over to the book of Joshua. We're going to be in chapter 5 uh, for this uh, message. And so head that way. I want to talk to you tonight, preach on this idea that uh, onward to victory sometimes means standing still. Uh, Joshua chapter 5 is uh, uh, where we'll jump off. Uh, as you're turning there, have you ever stopped to consider how, uh, how a pivotal decision that maybe seems like a small decision in the moment can change the entire course of history? Uh, my mind thinks about that a lot. As I mentioned m multiple times, I, I, I like history. And so my mind and often some of the stories I read about uh, military history, uh, often victory and defeat uh, is hinged on some small little decision or indecision. Um, there's actually a branch of history that's called counterfactual theory that asks those questions and will and they will use those opportunities to go back in those pivotal moments of history and just say, what if this decision hadn't been made? Or what if this action hadn't been taken? What would history look like today? For instance, uh, years ago, I came across a story uh, about a private named Henry Tandy. He was the most highly decorated private in the B British Army during World War I. And yet, in spite of his acts of bravery and his uh, uh, receiving the Victoria Cross, um, that's not what he's most know known for. Uh, what he's actually most known for is on September 21st of 1918, uh, while fighting in a French village, um, a weary and wounded German soldier wandered into Tandy's line of fire. And in that moment, uh, he hesitated, uh, made eye contact with the German soldier, and the German soldier was so weary and tired he didn't even didn't even attempt to raise his weapon. And it was in that moment he made the decision 
uh, not to take the shot. In fact, the German soldier nodded his gratitude and stumbled off into uh, the future. Now, here's what's interesting. That soldier was Adolf Hitler. Now, some have reported that that's folklore or that it wasn't this particular private, but uh, from what I've read, at one point, Hitler ac actually acknowledged that an event very similar to that took place, where his life was spared during World War I. Man, can you imagine how different the world would, would be today? Uh, certainly through generations, um, had, had that outcome been different. I have wondered whether or not it was Tandy or not. Uh, whoever that soldier was, uh, I wonder how many sleepless, regretful nights that they've had. You see, sometimes we miss opportunities that in the moment sometimes seem insignificant or even seem like the right uh, decision, and they turn out to be monumental mistakes. In fact, um, I could preach messages from Scripture that would be biblical, um, that there are times that we need to, by faith, push forward, seize the day, so to speak, don't squander opportunities. Certainly, there are uh, many, many scriptural principles that could support that. But sometimes, seizing the moment is not always the action that we think it is. And that's where we come to Joshua chapter 5. And it seems like in this moment that God has provided, established a time for uh, Joshua and the people of Israel to seize the day, so to speak. In fact, in, in Joshua 5.1, uh, let me read that if you'll look there in your Bibles. Uh, it's a, it's a, a reiteration of what we already know to be true, that Rahab had already given this information to the spies, and it's just uh, going back to remind us that there was already this fear that was in in the hearts of the people of Canaan. And verse 1 says, It came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. The part that's already been established is that their hearts were removed with fear, and it just uh, compounded that fear when they... When they saw the waters dried up before Jordan, the people of Israel cross over. We talked about that last week. Certainly somewhere, um, uh, as any city during those days, uh, they would have had, uh, I'm, I'm sure, soldiers on guard, different places throughout their, their territory, keeping an eye for the enemy. And certainly uh, they knew they knew that God's people had been camped along the, the, the borders of Jordan for, or the river of Jordan for, for weeks or months or however long they were there, they knew, uh, they knew that, that Joshua and his people were there. And so certainly they saw that and they went back to report it and, it and it compounded that fear. Their hearts were melting. They had no fight in them. And so from that standpoint, you could say we understand it would appear to be that God had given them the prime opportunity to go and, and seek the victory at Jericho. They've crossed the river. They've established their memorials, one in the river, one at Gilgal. The Canaanites are filled with the fear of Yahweh. And specifically, it's not so much of the people that they're afraid of. They're, they're fearful because they see that the, that the God of Israel uh, is a powerful God. And, and now you can imagine the people of Israel are motivated. Man, they're, they're pumped. Uh, all this has taken place in such a way that the momentum seems to be building and in that moment, if you, were, if you were the general, if you were Joshua leading the army, uh, what would you do in that moment? I know what I'd do. I'd seize the day. I would grab my troops. I would head up uh, through the countryside to the city of Jericho, and uh, I would begin the battle. It seems like the perfect moment. But that's not what happens here. Um, God is going to have the Israelites stop here and do something that seems like an incredibly bad decision. Tactically speaking, for, a, for an army, this seems like the absolute worst decision that could possibly be made. You see, at this point, and, and I need to interject this before we jump into the story, at this point, uh, while the people are focused on Jericho, that's not what God is focused on. He's not even thinking about Jericho, if we could put it that way. He's focused on his own people because that's what God is concerned about in this particular moment. 
You see, often I think when we see an opportunity that appears to be strategic because of our mindset, because often uh, we see these moments and and we're geared to think this, that uh, we have to seize the moment. And again, I know there's times that it's absolutely true and biblical, which requires us to be discerning uh, children of God, uh, to know when the moment is. But there are times then that, that, that no action is what is required. The only time that we can confidently move forward in action is when we're already in right standing with God. So let's think about this before we jump into the text, before we get into the crux of the message. Um, when you stop and consider um, the things specifically in the Old Testament, but obviously God is true and, and consistent all through the ages, but when you consider what's exp- extremely important to God throughout the Old Testament, um, you might make a list of the things that God is uh, seems to be particularly concerned with, but probably right at the top uh, would be this. He's always concerned about the obedience of His people. Let me give you an example. You remember... Um, Of course, this would be um, not in the context of this scripture, but you know the story about King Saul uh, when he performed the sacrifice when he was supposed to wait on Samuel. He did what he thought was a good thing. Uh, A sacrifice before battle was appropriate, was right, um, and yet it wasn't for him to do that. And he was supposed to wait on Samuel. Samuel shows up and, and, uh, you know, the, the... Uh, discourse that takes place. What are you doing? And he makes these excuses. And Samuel's response was this, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. And here's what I would say to you, and I think you know this to be true, that God has always been more concerned about the obedience of his people more so than the service or sacrifice of his people. And so I want you to listen to this. I understand where we're going tonight. In every everything for this particular generation that we're talking about here in Joshua, this generation that is getting to go over into the promised land. So far, they have done everything right. They have listened to Joshua, they have been obedient, um, they have followed his commands and his leadership, and yet there was still one thing wrong. That one area that uh, they were still not obedient in is what we're going to cover today. That thing had to be taken care of before they're ready to march forward in victory. So let's read the context of the scripture tonight. The text we're going to look at at tonight is is verse 2 through verse 9. So in verse 2, Joshua chapter uh, 5 says this, that uh, at, at that time the Lord said unto Joshua, uh, make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins, and this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Unto whom the Lord sware that he would not show them the land which the Lord sware unto the fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. And their children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass... When they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their place in the camp till they were whole. Verse 9 says that the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. So that's where we are. That's what's taking place. This this, um, this, um, command of the Lord to be circumcised. And the thing that they were lacking in obedience was that they had not performed that um, circumcision. So now that it has been brought to their attention that this is what God expects, God is expecting that now they renew their obedience to Him. Now, in this particular passage, He doesn't. Uh, it's not mentioned specifically the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. It's not spelled out here, but that's what we're talking about. Um, that's what the circumcision was all about. And so, so why was it so important? 
uh, to the point that God says, you can't go forward until we do this. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to get this taken care of. Why? Why was it so important? Well, let's go back to the reasons for the circumcision. And we're going to do this briefly. I've got some scriptures that'll, um, that'll come up on your PowerPoint here in a moment. But um, I'm going to do this briefly just to remind you some things. I hope you'll go back and maybe uh, spend a little more time on this. But first of all, the, the circumcision was, a, was symbolic of God's promise to them. Back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, where we, we talk about the Abrahamic covenant, it says there, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And, and so again, he'll get into this, and we'll touch on some of the aspects of circumcision as we move forward. But that was the promise. And, and circumcision connected those two things. And, and God took it very seriously. He was so serious about circumcision that they'd be obedient to that. But there was a point in Exodus, if you remember, that Moses nearly, nearly lost his life because he had not circumcised his son. That takes place in Exodus chapter 4, verse 24. The Bible says, It came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. And she said, A bloody husband thou art. And again, that seems, seems like a pretty strong reaction to not just following through with this outward ritual. Um, why would God make such a big deal that he was even willing to, to take Moses' life? Well, it, it was important to God because it also symbolized their identity uh, 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 being connected to God. That's a big deal. God wants us to embrace our identity in him. In Genesis 17, uh, verse 9, the Bible says, God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in, in their generations. And this is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed ever uh, after thee. Every man, child among you, shall be circumcised. And again, you have to go back and read the whole context, but in a nutshell right here, what he's saying is, listen, Abraham, I, I, want, you to, I want you to be... Um, I don't want you to be afraid uh, to display who you are. Uh, I want you to be uh, emboldened that you're one of my, one of my children. And the way you're going to do that is, is every man child uh, from this day forth is, is going to uh, be circumcised. That's going to be their mark, their identity that, that they are me. And so in other words, it, what God is saying is if you refuse to be identified through circumcision to him, what you're refusing is to really be identified with God. That's a big deal. That's why it was such a big deal, because that's, that's what God chose uh, to mark his people as his people. There's also a statement to God. In other words, when they uh, were obedient to circumcision, they're basically saying this is God. God, I not only want your blessings, I'm not ashamed to call you my God. Uh, I'm telling you, I will do whatever it takes, whatever you require, whatever you ask uh, to identify with you. You know, often we just want the blessings of God. We don't necessarily want to be identified with God, but we certainly want his blessings. Circumcision was a way of saying to God, listen, um, I want all of you, whatever that entails. And it was also a statement to other nations. Uh, again, I don't know how all this... Uh, uh, unfolded where the nations knew who was uh, uncircumcised and circumcised. I, I think throughout uh, time, it became obvious that Israel, that was their mark. And so it was a statement to other nations. It was their way of saying, hey, listen, we only serve one God. We only serve the one true God. Uh, that's why we've been circumcised. And therefore, we're not going to follow your gods. It's not that we're being pious and, and, and boastful and braggadocious. We just know that we have the one true God. We're not interested in serving your gods. We will serve him and him alone. And I thought about that. I want to be careful not to take this too far, but I, I just began to ponder um, this thought in, in our history, even here in America. Um, you know, there was a day, um, and I know at times probably taken a little too far, but there was a day in the world that, uh, or in America, that the world understood that if somebody called themselves a, a Christian, um, 
there were certain things that a Christian would and would not do. It was expected. I don't want to go through a list because, like I said, I know some of those standards and personal convictions that that through the years uh, came out of that maybe went a little too far. Um, but the truth was you knew who a Christian was because they would or would not do certain things. They would behave in certain ways and not behave in other ways. Um, they would be good in business practice and they would be honest and, and forthright. And, and it was just obvious that, that, uh, that they were children of God. The people of God weren't ashamed to be called people of God. Now I'll address that a little bit in a moment, but uh, I'm going to tell you, we shouldn't be ashamed to be called by the name of God, by the name of Jesus Christ. Circumcision was also symbolic of uh, Israel's obedience. When we get back to Joshua in chapter 5, um, what we just read in verses 4 and 5 is that um, those that had come out of Egypt, their forefathers, they had been circumcised back in Egypt. And so as they spent their 40 years wandering in the wilderness, something happened. Um, you can only speculate uh, as to the reasons, but for whatever reason, they stopped uh, They stopped circ- circumcising their children. Their, 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 um, their boys uh, stopped doing that. They stopped uh, performing that right. And so even though this generation had been obedient in everything, even though it may not have been their fault because their parents didn't, didn't do it, they weren't obedient in circumcision which is kind of ironic because their fathers had been circumcised and they were obedient, and yes, yet they were the ones that were disobedient and stepping out by faith. And so here we are now at the crux of moving into Canaan land, and again, don't know why they stopped performing this circumcision. Maybe they were frustrated with God because of the wanderings, but, but now what happened was that um, they had refused to, to keep that, uh, that covenant with the Lord, at least that outward picture of it. And so they were no longer identified the way they were supposed to be. It's probably what verse 9 means by the reproach of Israel. Now, I'll talk about that in a minute, but here's what I would say, just kind of by the way. Uh, You know, God still um, has an expectation of His children uh, today in the New Testament, in our day and age, that we are properly identified with Him. You know, circumcision back then was an identity with that old covenant, with the uh, Abrahamic covenant. They were circumcised, saying, this is who we are. We are people of this covenant. You know, today, baptism identifies us with the new covenant, uh, with salvation through Jesus Christ. In fact, Colossians chapter 2 talks about that. It says in verse 11 of Colossians 2, "...in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands." See, it's a different circumcision. It's the circumcision of the heart. "...and putting off the body goes on of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ." Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. I was quickly say, just like the physical circumcision uh, itself was just symbolic of being God's people, uh, it wasn't in and of itself making them God's people, neither does baptism make us God's people. It just identifies us with what does make us God's people, and that is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the point is this. Before they could move up to Jericho, God wanted them to be re-identified with Him, wanted them to be obedient in that outward representation of who they were. Now, there was a risk in doing this, uh, a risk of circumcision. Uh, The reality was this was going to put them in a really vulnerable position for several days. You remember uh, back in the Old Testament in Genesis 34 where where the sons of uh, Jacob were avenging their sister Dinah with a certain group of people. and uh, they pretended to, um, to, to join them, to uh, include them into the uh, people of, of Israel. And they said, if, you, if you're going to become one of us, you have to be circumcised. And of course, we know that they use that as an opportunity to weaken them. And three days later, that group of people are still so weak, they can't defend themselves. And so certainly you follow, follow that into this point. Can you imagine the conversations around the camp? At Gilgal, when Joshua says, okay, listen, uh, God has spoken to me. And um, before we can go up to Jericho, uh, you all have to be circumcised. (laughs) Um, I'm just thinking practically, okay? Don't want to go too far with this, but I'm thinking, couldn't we have done this on the other side of Jordan where it's a lot safer? Um, uh, Why not wait till after the battle? Um, Joshua, this doesn't seem to be a, this seems to be a horrible, uh, horrible idea. 
tactically speaking, why would we do this right now? And put ourselves, we're really close to the city of Jericho, and they know we're here. Why would we put ourselves in such a vulnerable position? Ironically, they were actually, the very things that they were going to use or could have used to go take advantage and gain the victory are the very things that are going to keep them safe. You see, the fear that their enemy, their enemies um, had because of, of Yahweh, um, even though it seemed like a perfect time to attack, it was that fear that kept them safe because they weren't going to come out and attack God's people. They were afraid to do so. So it actually created a buffer, a period of time, uh, where they would just hole up, most likely, and not come out against God's people. They were probably uh, in their walled city wondering, why are they waiting? When is the day going to come? And it gave them time to be obedient. You see, it would have been easy to uh, ignore God's command here. It would have been easy to justify moving on uh, rather than waiting. Um, R. Kent Hughes said it this way, it, is always, it always requires faith to obey but we must never attempt to justify our disobedience by speculating about what the consequences might be. Man, stop and think about that just for a minute. How often, how often we um, will justify doing things the way that we want to do them because of some horrible outcome that might come in our human thinking. And what we need to do is be willing to say, you know what? I know this is the direction God is leading. I may not understand it but I'm not going to step out on dis disobedience because I can't figure this out. Unfortunately, God's people here, they obey. And because they obey, the reproach or, or the shame, as he says, is rolled away in verse 9. The Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt off from you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to what that reproach may mean. And I won't take time in this message. I could elaborate and spend, you know, five, ten minutes talking about it. I'm just going to summarize what I believe specifically the reproach of Egypt meant. And you may have a different opinion, and that's okay. I, I think, in essence, if I could summarize it this way, he's referring to their double-mindedness. Double-mindedness. You see, they were God's people, but they were no longer identified the way they were supposed to be as being God's people. In other words, they were living under his blessing, but not being identified with him. Therefore, they had the appearance of being double-minded. And there's a danger of uh, being double-minded or not being fully obedient unto the Lord. Now, again, I know sim symbolically that that's all circumcision was, was just a symbol. It represented something, but what it represented was really important. It represented um, what was taking place in the heart. In other words, not submitting completely to God's command, um, by not doing that, they were straddling the fence. Uh, again, it doesn't elaborate completely here as to whether that was the intention, if that's really what they were doing, if they were following that mindset. But, but here's what I know. Had they not taken this time um, to circumcise themselves and to, to just sit here and, and let, let this process take place, if they'd have just marched up the hill to, to Jericho and gone on to battle and they would have won these victories, um, just put it in that context, although had God said this and they disobeyed it, they wouldn't have had those victories. But here's the point. Had God not uh, set this time aside, allowed them to go on up into Canaan and have those victories, most likely the victories to come would have led to, to prideful hearts. The... The wealth of the land would have caused a, a self-sufficiency. The false gods of the other nations would have been very alluring because they were still straddling the fence, wanting the blessings of God and also wanting to have things the way they wanted to have them. So a, a quick closing thoughts, and this is a, just going to be part one of at least a two-part message out of Joshua chapter 5. And then we'll stop here on our uh, in our text, but here's what I want us to think about. As we move onward, as they move onward to Jericho, certainly that was the right thing. When that time comes, that's absolutely what they should have done. It, uh, that's not in question. But it had it been done not in God's timing and not in God's way, we could ask the question, I wonder how things would have been. So where does that leave us tonight? Well, there's a couple thoughts that I want to spend a few moments um, 
addressing. The first thought that comes to my mind out of this passage is this, to have to ask you a couple questions. My first question is, what have you placed priority on in your walk with the Lord? Is it your outward service or is it your inward obedience? That's a tough, touchy subject, and where I'm going to go to in this particular message, I want to be gracious, but I know I've been guilty of this, and so I'm not just I'm not just preaching at you, I'm preaching to myself, because we are all guilty uh, of falling into this particular pattern time and time again. Israel, here they are, they're ready to, to charge the gates of Jericho. They are ready to do great things for God. In fact, they're uh, they're ready to do whatever they think it is that is right to gain the promised land that's been promised to them. But in that, they're still living in disobedience to the God that they claim to love and to serve. And just like King Saul, the outward service meant nothing because of the inward disobedience. Now, you need to stop and think about that. You see, it's not just so much about what we do. It's a matter of why and how we do it. And sometimes we lose sight of that. We do things things the way that we want to do them. And we sometimes ignore what God is leading us to do. And I've watched through the years uh, many of God's children fall into this pattern where they serve consistently year after year. They even run ministries and serve people and do an abundance of good things. They give faithfully. Uh, They attend services faithfully. And and all of the outward uh, behaviors that you would say, that person seems like a dedicated child of God. Now, again, I don't want to take uh, away from those things because um, those are things that are expected of us. But what happens often is suddenly then one day that person will just disappear. Something happens. Often it's blamed on a person, personality, or a decision, or an action that happened or didn't happen. But if we were to be honest, the reality is that often that person was not separated unto the Lord the way they were supposed to be. They were doing the right things, but they were doing them for the wrong reasons and in the wrong manner. And here's the thing I want us to get. There's way too many specifics that I could line out for application and illustration. Um, I could make you a list. I'm not going to do that. Um, But here's what I would say. God expects you to be obedient to what He has commanded, and He expects you to be obedient in the way that He has commanded you to be obedient. I just would challenge you, listen, um, You can do your service and all those things, but if you don't have the basics down, love of the brethren, love of the Word of God, uh, walking in humility, doing the things the way God has asked you to, all your sacrifice, all your service is meaningless if you're not first, first completely consecrated and separated and obedient to Him, not just on the outside, but on the inside. My second thought is this, that sometimes God's demands seem risky. And nevertheless, he still expects our obedience. Again, I already mentioned this, but tactically speaking, what Joshua is asking them to do to be circumcised here in the heart of Canaan, uh, that's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. Well, that's the point sometimes, isn't it? God sometimes will ask us to do things that seem crazy. Because what that means is we can't always logically figure out how things are going to happen. And therefore, we have to make a choice to trust the Lord or not trust the Lord. And that's what he's asking them to do in this moment. I would say God works the very same way today as he did back in the days of Joshua. You know, it takes on so many different forms, but the processes are still the same. You know, uh, many of you remember um, the, the Barlow family, uh, the missionaries to Slovenia. They were here um, uh, earlier this year, uh, and uh, they're good friends of uh, Jennifer and, and I. We go back uh, several years, and uh, same age, and I told you a little bit of his story then. I won't elaborate a lot in this moment, but Monty Barlow uh, had, a, um, had an established career as, uh, I believe, an engineer making decent money. Um, 
could have lived comfortably. His family all established in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Um, uh, kids were growing, uh, family established, uh, serving in the church. And yet God put on his heart something crazy. Uh, in the midst of all of that, um, he laid on his heart to become a missionary uh, to the country of Slovenia. That's crazy. Who does that? Um, not somebody in their right mind, right? And I tell you, um, maybe that's why God's not called me at that point in my life to go to Slovenia, because that doesn't make any sense to me. But you know, when God lays something on your heart like that, regardless of how crazy it seems, He expects you to be obedient. And praise the Lord, the Barlows were obedient. And I would say this, um, um, I think God lays crazy things on all of our hearts. Now, it doesn't have to be the mission field. Um, it might be something as simple as to give what you don't think you can give. Or maybe it's something as simple as to serve in a capacity that you don't think you can serve in. Or to stay in a situation that you don't think you can bear anymore. I was saying there's a list of things that we could make, and, and I won't do that. I want the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart, but I believe with, uh, with all of my heart, and I believe biblically speaking, that, that God will ask us at times to stretch ourselves to a place that it just seems crazy. It doesn't make sense that you would want me to do that or to stay in that situation or, or not to do this, God. I don't get that. And the reason He does that is so that we have to, by faith, trust Him. Just move out by faith. And here's what I recognize, and I'm guilty of this. We too often approach God's requests uh, with a human intellect. Uh, God speaks to our heart. We see that he might be moving in a direction, and then we begin to rationalize all the reasons why or why we should not step out by faith. And often we'll rationalize and scrutinize what God is doing to the point that we completely miss what God is asking us to do, and that is just simply trust him and obey him. Here's what I would say to you. Don't let your human reasoning keep you from being obedient and trusting the Lord. And I think we can think ourselves right into being disobedient. Sometimes it's based on emotion. Sometimes it's based on our own intellect. But either way, when it comes time, again, I'm not saying you should just be blind, blindly uh, stepping out and doing everything that comes across your mind. Certainly, you got to make sure it's of the Lord. But be careful that you don't overthink something to the point that you're not obedient to Him. And lastly... I just want to ask you a really heartfelt question, and I don't mean it to sound mean or, or ugly or uh, finger point, pointing, but the question in the context of the Scripture has to be asked. Is there a reproach in your own life that needs to be rolled away? Now, for them, we're talking about the lack of being circumcised. And as I said, it represented them being double-minded. And it, and it, in essence, what they're saying is, is this. They're saying this to God. God, we, we want to be called your people when it's convenient for us, but otherwise, I want to just do things the way that I want to do them. You understand what I'm saying? Can you relate to that? I don't know about you, there's been times in my life that I've been guilty of that. Probably every child of God at some point has been guilty of that. And it's an easy pattern to get into. Certainly, we love the blessings um, that God affords us. But man, sometimes we sure like the, the things of the world so much that we try to straddle the fence. We, tried to, we try too often to, uh, to leave our options open. I'm going to be dedicated to this point, but just in case something good comes along over here, I want to make sure that I have that available as well. You know, I think too often, unfortunately, especially here in America, Christianity today has become more and more about straddling the fence. It's become more and more about wanting to, to have Jesus in, in, in our life and all the blessings that come with him, but we certainly want to leave our options open to do what we please. Now, here's the danger to that. Over and over, this mindset will lead God's people further and further from him. Because the more we have our options open, the more we'll take those options. The more we'll follow plan B and plan C. I tell you, it's a dangerous thing not to be wholly consecrated unto the Lord. That's the reproach that, that he's talking about here, the double-mindedness of God's people. So I would just ask you this question. Again, from a loving heart, just trying to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to reveal in your heart, 
if this is a truth? Is it possible that you've been straddling the fence in the walk that you have with God? Is there something that you need to simply just turn over, turn over to the Lord? Something you've been hanging on to that you know God wants you to turn loose of? Maybe it's uh, simply saying, you know what? I need to just be baptized or I just need to, uh, to get this thing out of my life. You know, before all this uh, COVID thing uh, came up to be, um, had somebody come to my office and just said, uh, you know, I've been saved a long time and I need to be baptized and I'm just going to do it. Now, that's not every person. I'm just telling you, when we get back together, you're going to you get to meet who that is because we, we've set that time aside to make sure that that's going to happen. I'm just telling you, in, in that testimony, that person said, listen, I know this is something I need to take care of and I've been, I've been kind of straddling the fence on it. And I just want to get on off the fence and do what God is asking me to do. And that could be any number of things in your life. And I would just simply say this, listen, you need to take care of that and let God roll away the reproach of the sinful life. I tell you, that's the first steps to victory. Marching on to victory can't happen until we sit in obedience to our God. Well, I hope that's an encouragement tonight. I hope it's a, a challenge to you uh, as it needs to be. Before we close, let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for the stories, the accounts that are recorded in Scripture of your people real people that are just like us, that struggle, that have decisions to make, that are required to walk by faith, and we get to look at their lives as a testimony, as an example of how we should live today. Lord, as we've examined a little bit of these first steps of uh, moving into the promised land for God's people, uh, it's been a great reminder that uh, we certainly want to make sure that we have consecrated ourselves to you and to be, uh, be living our lives in complete obedience to you. So God, I pray that you would speak to all those under the sound of this message, God, that you would challenge the hearts to make sure that we have consecrated, set apart ourselves to you completely, not just in our actions, but in our heart. I ask this in Christ's name, amen. Well, thank you again for being here with us uh, through uh, social media, through YouTube. And uh, again, looking forward to where we can get together and that's gonna be real soon. Be praying about that. Um, we got a lot of things that we've got to learn on our end, um, how to make those services go. Uh, service itself will be fairly normal, but for us behind the scenes, trying to make that happen, we've got a lot to learn. And so be praying that God will give us some good direction in, in, that, uh, in that manner. Certainly be praying for uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ as we get ready to come back together. God would uh, ease concerns, provide a safe environment uh, that we can once again be uh, worshiping together. And so until then, God bless you. We're praying for you and we'll see you then. Take care. Hi there. Thanks for tuning into the Victory Baptist Church YouTube channel. We hope this message was a blessing to you. If it was, we'd ask that you'd subscribe down below and click the bell. That way you can be notified the next time we upload a video. If you'd like to hear more from Victory Baptist Church, we invite you to our website, victorybyfaith.org, where you can see our past sermons, our different ministries, and our service times. Because once we are able to gather together, we'd love to have you come and visit. Until then, have a great day and God bless.